Hi, my name is Fons, and for the past year and a half, I've been working on Pluto.gl. It's a new programming environment for Julia that's mainly designed to be simple, good for education, and good for exploration. I'm very excited to be here at JuliaCon 2021 because it was only one year ago in 2020 that we introduced Pluto to the Julia community. If you do not yet know what reactivity and Pluto is, uh, I recommend watching last year's talk where we introduced it for the first time. And then this year, I would like to show what's new, what have we been doing for the past year, and what's coming in the next year. One really cool feature of Pluto is reactivity. Uh, it means that Pluto tracks um, all the code that I write and it finds dependencies between cells. In this example, C depends on A and B. So when I change one of them, the cell for C is also reevaluated. Now, this is very cool because it helps you prevent bugs and it makes everything very interactive, which is cool for exploring your models. Now, it does come with one disadvantage, which is that sometimes it's evaluating a lot of cells because of reactivity um, and you're kind of stuck waiting for other cells to complete. As an example here, I have a function called load data, where I type in the name of a city and it gives me a data set for that city. Uh, I plot the data, I find a trend line to my data, use that to get an approximation of my data. And finally, I used hypertextliteral.gl to generate a little report. Let's say I change the name of my city. Now, um, it's taking four seconds to compute this trend line and then another four seconds to generate this report, which means that it will take eight seconds between uh, typing in the name of a city and typing in another name of a city before I can do things again, because I'm waiting for these cells to complete. So there's a new feature called disable cell. And let me just disable this report. And now, when I change the name of my city, you see that it will do the reactive run, but it will not generate my new report. So that's great. But what makes this really cool is, let's disable the cell that computes a trend line. You see that instead of just disabling this cell, it now also disabled cells that depend on it. And now when I change the name of my city, I can really quickly change it because these cells are not running. What I like about this is how it's not just throwing away reactivity, um, it's actually using that same syntax analysis and the reactivity algorithm to now disable your cells. So it's a very good middle ground between having reactivity and having a classical environment. So really cool feature. Thank you to Marius for the idea and to Benjamin and Paniotis for implementing it. Okay, here we are in the new version of Pluto just installed on the computer with no other packages installed yet. I open a new notebook and I type using plots and right there next to the package name is a new icon. When you click on it, it says plots will be installed in the notebook when you run this cell. All right, let's run the cell. And you see that now it's started installing plots and I can see the progress of the installation right there in the notebook. Okay, it looks like it's done. So let's add a new cell and try it out. And there you go. In the new version of Pluto, you can import any package and use it straight away. Everything will be installed automatically. So let's add a couple more packages. Using autocomplete, I can find all registered packages and I can use them straight away. While packages are installing, I can continue writing codes and I can import more packages. And just like that, just by typing the names of the packages, we've set up a new environment with three packages installed and we were able to use them right away. How cool is that? But what is more exciting is what you couldn't see.
This new feature is created by integrating with Julia's package manager, which sets up an isolated package environment for every notebook. And now even better, this isolated package environment, the information to recreate it, is now stored inside the notebook file. To see this in action, let's look at the same demo as before, except now on the right you see a Pluto notebook, and on the left you see the notebook file as it is being edited. So again, let's do using plots. And you see that now two new cells got added to the notebook. The Pluto project toml contents and the Pluto manifest toml contents. The first file, the project toml, contains the names of all the packages that you use and the version number that you use them. And then to ensure reproducibility, we also include what's called the manifest file, which in addition to the direct dependencies, so plots, also includes the versions of all the indirect dependencies, so that when someone else opens your notebook, it can exactly reproduce the versions of all the packages that were used to run it. As you see, when I add more packages, they get added to the project tunnel, and the file gets updated. Now, when I delete cells, Pluto knows that the package is no longer being imported, so it also deletes it from the project environment. Okay, so what I just showed is how it works, but the important part is this, you don't need to know it. The next time you open Pluto, you can just import packages. When you're happy with your notebook, you send it to your friends, and you can be sure that they will open your notebook with the same versions of the same packages. We have a reproducible package environment by default. Pluto's new package management will be used for all new notebooks and old notebooks will be converted automatically. Now, Pluto will just install the latest version of any package that you use, but if you want a more specific environment, for example, you need a specific version of a package or you want to use a package that is not registered, then you have to set up the environment yourself. If in your notebook you use pkg.activate, then Pluto's new package management will be disabled entirely and you are now free to set up your own environment. To learn more about pkg.activate and Pluto's package manager, uh, open Pluto, import a package, and inside the package pop-up, there's a help button. And when you click there, you go to the documentation where we explain the basic usage, some common questions, and we show advanced strategies using pkg.activate. Okay, next up, let's talk about sharing your work. So Pluto is great for exploration, but perhaps more important is the ability to share your work after it's done. This is why we added the export bar. And to show this, let me move my face. So on the, on the top right, you have this new button. And there you see the three export options that we have right now. So you get your notebook file, um, a static HTML file and a static PDF file. And this gives you easy access to those three without having to use your file manager. So for example, if I click on the notebook file, then it is right there. And uh, for example, I can just copy all of this and send it in an email. Yeah, so that's the notebook file, pretty much what you expect. Then there's a PDF file, also what you expect. Pops up a menu, choose your um, can you choose your files, your, your paper size, etc., and then it will print that for you. Okay, uh, finally the HTML. So um, it might be a bit strange to send an HTML file, but for Pluto it makes a lot of sense because Pluto notebooks are designed to look really good in a browser to work on all screen sizes, so uh, mobile, desktop, etc. So if I click here, I get an HTML file and it saves that and let me just open that and it's just one file you don't need any other files and it contains um, it kind of contains the pluto editor but without the bar at the top without the live docs uh, without editing it contains the notebook file and then the state that you had it in including all the outputs and now what's cool is this gives you access to two new things that you might not have noticed before 
And those are hidden behind the button in the top right, where it says edit or run this notebook. And you get this when you send the HTML file using, so using this button, get the HTML file, send it to your friends, and then they will see this button. It gives you two options. Uh, so one is on your computer, you just click this button, uh, click, and then I'm downloading the notebook as a .yl file, and I can open it in Pluto, or alternatively, I can run it on binder. And so what this means is the notebook file is embedded in the HTML file, which is really cool. So you just, you can just share the HTML file and you're also sharing the notebook file. And so binder, um, is a nonprofit organization, um, that allows you to run scientific notebooks in the cloud. Uh, and this is designed to, uh, my face, and this is designed to make it uh, make it easier for scientists to share their work. So again, just inside this HTML file, I can click this button. You will see that it starts loading uh, binder, it starts loading binder in the background. So it starts connecting and while it's loading, I can still just read the notebook um, and it will take some time. Binder needs to find a free computer for me, uh, launch Pluto, etc. If you're a teacher, you can put these HTML files on your course website, and then students will be able to view your notebook and run it directly on your website. We use this for the computational thinking course at MIT. And there we have one more trick where without having to wait for a binder server, students can instantly try out sliders and buttons and webcams and all inputs. Uh, to learn more about how this works, go to our other Julia.com talk, where we talk about the computational thinking course. And so macros uh, are a really powerful feature. They can take any bit of syntax and turn it into something else. And there are many Julia packages that use macros for lots of creative applications. So this is quite cool. But if you have used these sorts of packages in Pluto before, so in old Pluto, uh, you might have noticed that if you do something like if you reevaluate a cell that contains a macro, you get these strange errors. Um, this is because Pluto has this reactivity at its core, which is based on syntax analysis. It looks at code and tries to figure out what is defined and what is referenced. And this is going wrong when you use macros. Now, this is a very difficult problem. Um, luckily, being an open source project, we attract very bright people, including Paul, who has recently fixed this problem. So here we are in the new Pluto, which has macro support. Um, it works by doing the same syntax analysis as we did before, except now we can evaluate in multiple phases. So we evaluate some cells, like including packages. And then we go back and try to use those packages to expand any macros. So to use those macros to do the syntax transformation. And then we try to analyze the new syntax that's generated by the macros. So this means that we are able to support almost all macros by using the macros themselves as part of our reactivity algorithm. So here you see I'm defining X and Y. I can really easily uh, rerun this cell. It's not causing any problems. So yeah, really cool. Thank you, Paul. Amazing work. This means that you can use packages like symbolics.jl, modeling toolkit, flux, query.jl, and much more. Pluto is a Julia notebook, but since we output to a web page, we also allow you to write JavaScript. Um, I think that JavaScript since it runs on all phones, all desktops, is a great way to get people excited about science, uh, since you can use JavaScript to create the best animations and interactive experiences. Um, Julia is great for science, and I think Pluto is a great way to combine these two. The basic idea is that a cell can output HTML like this, um, but if, it, if the HTML contains a script tag, then those will be executed. And now we have a lot of extra features. Um, and if you're a bit scared about JavaScript, then cover your ears. Um, but the first important feature together with hypertext is that we can share objects directly 
uh, with the JavaScript process. So in this case, I'm sharing the array row um, with JavaScript and it's available there. And we can do this without serialization. We share raw data. You can use this together with frameworks like React, Vue, D3, and you can use libraries like Plotly uh, to generate all sorts of outputs. Here's an example of using D3 to animate um, the positions to animate these coordinates as the positions of dots. And here uh, I'm showing off something else, which is persistence. Even though this cell at the bottom is rerunning, we can use this to persist the output of a cell and to animate the dots in between cell changes. And this, like many other things, matches the API of observable HQ. Uh, I have an example of Preact. Um, finally, uh, you can also manipulate the editor itself because it is part of the browser. If you know a bit of JavaScript and you're interested in this, um, you can watch the talk about JavaScript inside Pluto uh, in PlutoCon, or you can read this notebook, which is one of the sample notebooks that you can read from the main menu of Pluto. Thank you, Michiel, for working together with me on this. I think this is a very promising feature because it is such an easy way to combine Julia, the scientific language, with JavaScript, the interactive language of the web. Uh, I hope that lots of people will enjoy it. So this is what we've been working on for the past year and a half, uh, a notebook system for Julia, written in Julia, that understands the code that you write and tries to help you with it. Um, talking about the future of Pluto, uh, let me just go back to the main idea behind it, which is that programming is way too difficult. Um, beginners have a really difficult time getting into programming, but even the ones who are experienced are still having trouble. Here's uh, a quote from an interview with Jonathan Edwards. Those of us who are good at abstraction are the ones that flourish in programming, yet even we don't have the power enough to pull it off. We are constantly failing and making mistakes and unable to comprehend what it is that we've just done. If you think about the, the work that you do programming, you're making mistakes all the time. And is that normal? If you could only just minimize this intellectual burden of programming, then regular people will be able to do it, but we would also be able to do more. And perhaps this explained why Pluto, uh, a notebook environment designed for high school students and university students, turned out to be popular among data scientists and more experienced programmers. I think even if you are experienced in programming, uh, there's still so much that can go wrong and you can definitely use the help of an environment that understands the code that you are writing. So perhaps visual programming is the solution. Here are two visual programming languages that I've worked with before, Scratch and LabVIEW. And I think the strong part here is education. Um, people can really quickly pick up these environments and they're picking up real programming just in a smarter, uh, more natural environment. And the second thing is the ability to communicate your program. After it's done, other people can easily follow the flow of what you were doing. But I don't think we should give up on textual programming. Um, this is the progress we've made over the years. We went from writing raw processor instructions to writing instructions about how your data structure should be manipulated to descriptive programming, for example, in Julia, where I describe what I want. I want the sum of A over the columns. Uh, and these are three code examples to do the same thing, getting the column sums of a matrix. So there is real value in textual programming, and Julia has shown me this, um, which is the generality and the conciseness. So something that I would like to explore is the space in between visual programming and textual programming. Since we're talking about the future of Pluto, um, I thought I would show a couple of experiments that in hindsight were kind of related. You know, recording a talk, um, you try to find a trend in what you've been doing recently. And for me, a trend has been 
um, you have all these boxes, like you have the input box for a cell, the output, for the output you might have your interactive data viewer, a graph, um, a box with Julia codes, like a Julia code snippet. Um, you have your LaTeX, and I've been looking for different ways of combining these, it turns out. It turns out that this is my hobby. Um, so, right, so in Pluto you have this interactive data viewer, I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, but can we put Julia code inside the data viewer? Well, yes, it's fairly easy. You just have a function that returns Julia code with syntax highlighting, put it in an object, and then you get it in the data viewer. Um, but can we do the opposite? Can we put objects inside code? So here I have a piece of simple Julia code, and with this slider, I can evaluate it step by step. So there I did seven minus six is one, three plus one is four. Now onto the next sign, uh, two plus two is four. And then the rand function gives me four random variables. And now I can click, interact with this array, see its values. We're multiplying by 30 and now adding 2000. This is the array. And now we're going to create a plot of this you can see the plot in there. Yeah, let me just keep this going. And so this was just like a fun, fun experiment, but then it turned out to be useful. Um, we were looking at testing. So uh, some people like to write tests inside that code. For example, if you are writing the function square root, then you might write a couple of tests while you're writing this function, uh, just to check that it's doing the correct thing. <laughs> And in this case, square root of top is 12 is more than three. And it's saying yes. Um, but I can actually click on this and go back in time and see why, why it returned to, or in this case, I have a test failure showing in red. And I can click and again, go back in time. Um, and all these arrays are interactive. So inside my test, time machine, I can look at the, the objects, which is pretty cool. Uh, so you can use this package today. It's called pudotest.jl, uh, currently in alpha, but try it out and let me know what you think. So another experiment, uh, also, you know, a rainy weekend staying at home, um, was this, can we put objects inside LaTeX equations? So here I have Let's see, a picture of my dog inside an equation. And then uh, the number five is interactive. So I can click and drag and use the value of that number somewhere else in my code. Okay, so I don't really have a conclusion, uh, but you know, hope you enjoyed. Next up, let's, <laughs> let's talk about visual programming again. One experiment in visual programming is what I'm going to show now, which is a prototype of Pluto, where uh, widgets, graphical elements, can be embedded inside code. So here you see that I'm defining x as the value of a slider, and inside the code I can interact with that slider to set the value. And so x is just a number, and the slider is just something inside my code. So for example, to create two sliders that add two numbers, I just copy the slider and paste it. And now I have two sliders. To create an interactive two by two matrix, I just copy the slider and I create a matrix of sliders. And now I have an interactive matrix. So coming back to um, perhaps the value of visual programming. Uh, to me, a strong value is education. I think visual programming is more accessible to more people and we can see it as a way to introduce people to textual programming. Um, I think one of the really cool features of Excel uh, is how you can create an Excel spreadsheet with an analysis and then send it to someone and you just ask them to fill in their data and then the analysis will run for them. You can already do this inside Pluto, but using these kinds of widgets, it might be easier for people uh, to interact with the notebook that you sent them 
without feeling like they might break something because you know that by just by feeling just by moving these visual widgets you're not going to break something you're just interacting with the program but also you're not losing the power of textual programming uh, if you use this in your class for example then students can use this to really easily interact with your uh, with your scientific code but if they like they can just go in and edit the notebook code and i think this is very important to uh, if you have a visual programming environment to not lose the power that you would get out of a general programming language okay so what i've shown today uh, is not going to be released soon uh, it's still just an experiment but if you're interested in these sorts of experiments and you know javascript then get in touch and we can work on this together. All right, that's it for me. Lots of exciting stuff. Uh, if you would like to hear even more about Pluto, we have one more talk by Connor Burns. It's about turning notebooks into REST APIs automatically. Um, if you are interested in working on this and you know JavaScript, then we have an open developers call every Thursday evening. You're welcome to come and join us and work with us Thanks so much. Thank you, Julia Cohen. Bye.